welcome back uh, to the post coffee session so the next two sessions uh, which is uh, this session before lunch and the session after lunch uh, our invited speaker is sanjit seshia he is uh, of course a very well known uh, name in this area he is a professor in the department of uh, electrical engineering and computer science at uh, university of california berkeley uh, his research interests are uh, in formal methods uh, in dependable and secure computing uh, with a focus on cyber physical systems computer security uh, machine learning and robotics he uh, has made significant contributions to the areas of smt smt based verification synthesis and recently on applying formal methods uh, for verifiable uh, ai and ml uh, he is a co-author of a widely used textbook on embedded and cyber physical systems uh, has several awards to his name uh, i won't list out all of those uh, and he's also a fellow of the ieee so we're very glad to have sanjit with us today he's going to give two talks uh, on uh, to different but related topics. Okay, thank you, Supatik. Thanks for the kind in, uh, invitation to come. Um, always very nice to be back here at IIT Bombay, which is my alma mater. Um, and and uh, also nice to be back at the SAT SMT uh, Winter School, which, I, which is now in the fourth year, I think, right? And I remember speaking at the very first edition. And it's very nice to see how this uh, Winter School has continued and, and grown. Um, so, uh, as Supratik said, I'm going to be giving two talks, and um, both of these are going to be more, I would say, on the application side of SAT and SMT. Um, and also, I made a, a rather conscious choice to, to talk, uh, to give a bit more of a breadth overview rather than go deep into one thing. Um, so I'll be talking more about the applications and then giving you a bit of a, a broad overview. But I, I hope to highlight some of the uh, I guess my personal opinions on where I think SAT, SMT, and especially extensions of what we have today can really have a nice impact. Okay, so uh, so the first talk, this one, uh, is going to be on a system called Euclid 5, uh, which uh, we've been developing at, at Berkeley and now uh, bet between Berkeley and IIT Kanpur uh, for uh, the last few years. And uh, I'll uh, explain the rationale for building uh, this new verification, modeling verification system uh, in, in, the, in the talk. Um, but it's really the crux of it is about um, integrating formal modeling along with techniques for algorithmic verification and algorithmic synthesis and uh, also data-driven learning. Um, and uh, the system was created jointly with a number of people, particularly Pramod Subramanian, who was a postdoc with me, and now he's uh, on the faculty at IIT Kanpur. Okay, so I want to start by um, putting up a, a quote, one sentence from a, a classic paper in formal methods. Does anyone recognize this? What paper this is? Okay, the hint is it's the very first sentence of a very famous paper. Sorry? Uh, no, not quite. What's that? Tony Rosner, no. <laughs> Although <laughs> you're getting closer. It's a good guess, though. So you would think, right? It's something to do with synthesis. This is actually the first sentence of the Clark and Emerson model checking paper. Um, and that's the interesting thing is to read this paper, and we always think about model checking as a technique for verification, right? Not synthesis, but they were really after a kind of synthesis in that paper, right? So one of the messages of this talk is that verification and synthesis are very tightly uh, integrated, really, and it's not just the connection going back to this particular paper, uh, where they you can think of it as you know starting out with the aim to do synthesis and then ending up with a very nice technique for verification, but it's also going the other way. Okay, and this, using verification for synthesis, this is a, a trend that has especially been very productive in the last 15 years. Okay, so I'm just gonna give my personal view. I'm sure there are many other groups that have been working on this, but my personal view is uh, based on the work that uh, my collaborators and I have been doing in 
in what is called program synthesis widely. Uh, in particular, uh, we had a large uh, project uh, called the Escape Project in uh, uh, the US, and Kuldeep was a student, a graduate of the project. Um, and there, uh, some of the techniques we used was to use verifiers as oracles to answer queries that you use for program synthesis. So one technique is uh, quite widely used today, which is counterexample guided inductive synthesis. It's the counterpart of counterexample guided abstraction refinement, but for program synthesis. And uh, there's another uh, uh, class of problems called syntax guided synthesis that I will tell you more about, um, which is actually very close to what our first speaker talked about this morning, which is using a grammar and uh, having the grammar guide the search for programs broadly defined, right? Okay, so, so that's a connection where verification is used and solvers are used for synthesis. So a few trends. Uh, so first of all, uh, one of the things that has been happening in the last 20 years is that as people try to apply formal methods in industry, right, and in, in large problems, the first stumbling block is often specifications. Like, where do the specifications come from? Where do the properties come from? And it's not just the properties you want to verify, it is the properties that you need to verify the properties you want to verify, like all the auxiliary invariants and all of that stuff. Right? And specification mining, which is learning specifications from data, has been a big enabler. And I myself had experience working with uh, automotive companies. Um, the second is uh, inductive synthesis. Okay, so the word inductive here is used differently from mathematical induction. It's used in the sense of in induction from examples, ex induction from data, learning from data. Um, and so inductive synthesis is synthesis from example. This is also a very dominant paradigm in program synthesis today, right? Um, and it's close to machine learning in a sense, but I'll, 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 later on in my talk, I'll make a, a, a distinction from uh, purely data-driven synthesis. And the third, of course, is data-driven design. And by this, I mean really the use of AI and ML, specifically machine learning components in uh, other kinds of systems. So all three of these uh, trends have really uh, come together in the last uh, two decades. And um, now, uh, I think one thing that we're seeing now is we need to build formal systems, so things like model checkers, verifiers, things like that, with a view that um, you're going to have in some kind of inductive learning and synthesis integrated into these. Okay, and so um, in this talk, I'll try to give a, a, a flavor of some of the things that, um, that I think are interesting in this area and some application domains. But um, I actually uh, wrote a paper about this uh, almost eight years ago. Uh, it was published at DAC and then a journal version in the Proceedings of IEEE. So I encourage you to read this uh, because I don't have the time today to talk about all of those. Okay, so broadly speaking, there's three connections here. There's like connections between synthesis, verification, and learning. Um, and then, as I just mentioned, uh, around 2016, we realized that there was really no formal tool uh, that made all these connections, that, that allowed you to kind of use synthesis seamlessly to solve verification problems, or was able to integrate machine learning into solving uh, verification tasks and things like that. And so that's really why we sought to develop a new one, which is called Euclid 5, okay? So uh, I hope to give you a demo of Euclid 5 at the end, um, but it won't cover all the features. But I'm, and it's open source, and I uh, encourage you to, uh, to look at it and try it out, and, and we, we would love to get feedback. All right, so, um, so before I dive into the talk, I just wanted to state what are the assumptions I'm making about about the audience here. So I try not to make too many assumptions. Um, so really, I assume that you know what is SAT, what is SMT, and what is model checking. Maybe not the how of how these are solved, but the what, right? So SAT, you're given a Boolean formula over some number of uh, propositions or variables, uh, P1 to Pn, and you're asking, is there an assignment to the PIs such that the formula evaluates to a uh, one or true? SMT, similar thing. Uh, but now you have uh, a Boolean combination of predicates over some underlying combination of background theories. And now the question is, is there an assignment to the variables in those theories that causes the overall formula to evaluate to one? Uh, model checking, um, there's a couple of different ways to define it. I would say today model checking is defined quite broadly as uh, a collection of algorithmic methods that are all based on some kind of state space exploration 
to verify if a system satisfies a specification, a formal specification. But if you go back to the original Clark uh, definition, uh, in, the, in, for example, the model checking textbook, um, there it's defined very, very specifically as it's a technique to check if a finite state system is a model of a specification that's given as a temporal logic formula. Okay? All right, so um, I'm assuming that you know what these are. And I will refer to a temporal logic formulas and things like that in, in both of my talks. And I'll try to, if you don't know temporal logic, that's okay. We can, I'll explain what the formulas are as we go. Good, so this is the outline for my talk. Uh, I'll first give you some motivation, uh, especially of one of the problem domains that uh, also drove us to create Euclid 5. So it's not just the connections between synthesis, verification, and learning, but also we came across a new class of problems um, that we felt were not well served by existing tools. So I'll talk about that, which is the verification of trusted computing platforms. Um, then I'll talk about uh, the use of synthesis, particularly syntax-guided synthesis, and uh, uh, a flavor of inductive synthesis I'll call formal inductive synthesis. Um, then I'll tell you about Euclid 5, and I'll uh, give you a demo of some of its features, um, and then we'll conclude. Okay? All right, so we'll start with this one. So this is the area of uh, the, 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 the general area of secure computing. And um, now that more and more computing is moving to the cloud, right, we all have this goal of uh, like we want to have secure remote computation. Okay, what does that mean? So imagine that you're the client so on the left, and you're using services that are in the cloud, so in Azure or, or AWS or something like that. And you have these sorts of uh, objectives, right? So you, maybe you have, you're using um, uh, email that's hosted in the cloud, or you're using a file sharing service that's hosted in the cloud, and some of your data is secret. And so you want to have a guarantee that does my secret data remain secret, that no, nobody who is not authorized to touch the data should be able to see it. Um, the second is uh, maybe you're using uh, programs running in the cloud, you're paying for them, right? So a good example, actually a good example for all three of these questions is, uh, at least in the, uh, in the US, is tax preparation software. So you're using tax software that is hosted in the cloud, maybe you've paid for it, so you want to know, first of all, that the private data about, that you're using for computing taxes should remain secret. Secondly, you're paying for this program, so you want to make sure that it's running as it, it, it is specified to be. And thirdly, you want to know that the program that you're paying for is the one that executed in the cloud, right? So that particular program should be running. Okay. So the first question is a question about confidentiality. The second question is one about integrity. And the third question is a question of attestation. You want to know the program running in the cloud is the one that you, uh, that, that you want. Okay. So now... That's the broad setup. Those are all the high-level objectives. So what are the kinds of attacks that are possible? Okay, so you're using your browser. Uh, so I'm using, in, in this case, a simple bank application, right? And to log into your bank account, you pass your username and pass, password to the server. It sends back secret data. Um, imagine that property you're interested in is confidentiality, okay? And so very classic uh, set of problems that people have looked at is um, network or protocol attacks. Right? So there's somebody who can snoop on the network traffic, and uh, you want to make sure that they can't see uh, what's, what's being transmitted, that is secret. Another class, also very well studied, are software security problems. So you have vulnerabilities in the software that can be exploited, and you want to know that, you want to make sure there's, uh, you have absence of those vulnerabilities. Um, more recently, there's been concern about uh, vulnerabilities that are lower in the stack, right? So in the operating system or the virtual machine, um, we'll call these software infrastructure attacks. Um, and then, even more recently, there are concerns about hardware, right? So that there can be problems, there are, there are attacks on, in the hardware, so either at the level of the microarchitecture or even at the circuit level. So these are a very broad class of attacks, and I've shown them on the client side, but they can also happen on the server end, right? Okay, so um, one of the things that uh, arose to help combat all of these attacks is uh, the use of trusted hardware. Okay, the general idea being that software is very hard to fully formally verify and make sure that none of those attacks are possible. Let's try to push uh, features that were traditionally uh, implemented in the OS and the hypervisor into hardware. 
okay? And particularly isolation between processes, okay? Um, and so this uh, idea had been known for a while, but about seven years ago, Intel said, uh, we are going to implement this in the, in the next generation of our x86 processors. They call these uh, SGX, Secure Guard Extensions. And, um, and then they you know, made a big splash about it. They started selling processors, implementing SGX, and that's when this really picked up steam. So the whole idea was that you can write an application um, in a way that you encode you, the security critical part okay, in what is called an enclave. So an enclave is a region of memory, including both code and data. Um, and the guarantee the hardware provides is that the, the enclave is completely isolated from the rest of the computing stack. Okay? So no process that is not authorized to uh, read or write to the enclave can actually do that. Okay? This is guaranteed by the hardware. Okay? So uh, in the case of Intel, uh, they said, we have formally verified this, trust us, everything will be fine. Um, and, but then there were groups that also said, well, we, we don't fully trust Intel because we want, ideally we want to be able to see what, it's, what is being verified. And so in particular, there was a group at MIT that built a processor called Sanctum based on the open uh, RISC-V ISA. Okay? So the uh, general worldview with enclaves is that now you can partition your application into two parts, a relatively small part that goes in the enclave, and then a larger portion, which is, does the rest of the stuff. So imagine computing with a standard MapReduce type of framework, um, and then you have uh, like a, a mapper program and a reducer program, and you can, what you can do is you can make sure that a small chunk of that program, even if it's implemented over a big system like Hadoop, there's a, only a small part of it that is sitting inside the enclave, which you know, will take encrypted uh, key value pairs, and then do the decryption inside the enclave and do the computation inside the enclave. So I'm not going to give a full tutorial here, but the general idea here is that now there's a combination of hardware and software that is um, giving this guarantee of isolation. Okay, but you know enclaves are are software themselves, and if people program enclaves in the wrong way, they can be exploited. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a challenge, and so, um, when, so there's a verification problem here, which is you want to make sure that enclaves are written in the right way, that outputs are always encrypted. There are no side channels that lead secret. I'll say more about this later. Um, and then ideally you want the guarantees at the level of machine code, right? so that you reduce your trusted computing base and you cut out the compiler. And furthermore, uh, about a year and a half, or maybe two years ago, there was big news that um, certain classes of processors, you know, quite a wide set, can be exploited. Uh, in fact, features, very common features in microarchitecture that have been implemented and taught for a few decades, uh, like speculative execution, can be exploited. Right? So we had uh, the news of the Spectre and Meltdown bugs that can do that. So this is, you know, uh, at the level of hardware, you want to make sure that um, your, uh, if you have an, a platform that claims to provide secure computing with enclaves, that it should be robust to this sort of attack, right? Okay, so that was a, a, a quick world world tour of the, of the topic, right? And so what we started looking at was how can we formally verify trusted enclave platforms, okay, to provide this guarantee of secure remote execution. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna talk about in the next 10 or so minutes, okay? So, the idea here is that uh, the user on the left okay, has a, a program and some secret data that they want to compute on a remote server, right? And so everything in red on this slide is untrusted. So they are sending it over an untrusted channel, right? And there are uh, other programs and the operating system and the hypervisor, the software stack, which is not trusted. The only thing that is trusted is the enclave itself and the enclave platform. And um, uh, you know, there is a way uh, involving cryptography that uh, the user can make sure that, that uh, they can send the, the enclave uh, over encrypted and make sure that it's set up in a way that they know that that's the program that's running on the platform. Okay, so let's ignore that part. Um, the questions we want to answer here are, I, I gave you uh, some minutes ago, I gave you in uh, sort of informal language 
goals of secure remote execution. So, but if we want to do verification, we need to be able to formally verify it and formally specify those things. So the first question is, what does it mean precisely? The second question is, uh, Intel has implemented a bunch of features and they claim secure remote execution. Uh, the RISC-V based platform also implements a different set of features, but you know, what is really required? What is the minimal set of platform features that is required to guarantee this? And then given these two things, how do you formally verify that uh, a given platform implements secure uh, remote execution, okay? So that's the question that we really set out to uh, answer. Um, and the details are in this uh, paper that is cited. Um, so the first thing is, I'll tell you about a formal definition of what secure remote execution is. I'll then show how you can decompose this into three kinds of properties. Um, then I'll talk about the formal model of this idealized enclave platform, uh, which I'll call the trusted abstract platform, or TAP. And then I'll tell you about our initial attempt at verifying uh, these models uh, using SMT-based approaches. Okay, good. So, by the way, stop and ask uh, questions if you have, if the, anything is not clear, okay? So, uh, I'll be, at this point, what I'm gonna do now is describe to you what we did, and then at the end of it all, uh, this is a, all, a, all a set of work that we did without using Euclid 5, but it was, it was kind of the motivation for us to create that system, one of the motivations for us to create the system. Okay, so uh, here's what the formal model looks like. So what you're seeing uh, on this slide is, uh, think of the, the lifetime of an uh, application running on a platform, okay? Um, and so what happens here is the, each dot is a state, and each arrow is a transition. Okay, so this is a trace. And the idea here is, at some point, the, uh, when an enclave uh, is uh, created, we call that a launch, right? So the enclave, the region of memory is created, okay, initialized with code and data. And then, when you start executing the enclave, um, there's a part of the, the, your browser which is not trusted, but when it starts uh, working on your secret data, it will then enter the enclave, okay? So everything in the box here is when the, the code from the enclave is running. So there's an enter point and an exit point. And then when it exits, it yields a control back to the untrusted host application, okay? And so if you look at the trace of the enclave and other programs running on the system, it's gonna look something like this, where there are subsequences of the trace that correspond to the enclave execution. Okay, so we're gonna take the concatenation of all these boxes and that will be a trace of the enclave. You look at the set of all possible valid traces of the enclave and that will be uh, double bracket E, okay? Um, then other th uh, important aspect of um, doing verification with, uh, for uh, security properties is you have to model the adversary. You have to create a formal model of the adversary. And so in our formal model, uh, we assume a so-called privileged software adversary. So think about this as uh, a program that can run at the highest privilege level um, in, in the software stack. So it's basically running with OS level privileges, kernel, kernel mode. Um, and this can tamper with the, try to tamper with the enclave by executing any arbitrary operations that are available to it, okay? And it can also observe anything that is written out in a channel that's observable for it, okay? Um, so the way we'll model this is using two functions, a so-called tamper function and an observation function, okay? Um, and you can just think of an observation function, for example, as taking the entire state of the platform and projecting it to the substate, the subset of that state that uh, it can observe, okay? Further, the adversary can run at any point, okay? So now you can see that all of these red arrows correspond to the adversary op operations and we assume an interleaving model of execution where the adversary operations can be interleaved with uh, the uh, enclave and other program operations. Okay, and so now this is our definition of secure remote execution. Okay, so we'll say that the remote platform securely executes the enclave program if two things hold. Okay, the first is that uh, now this enclave program is running on this remote platform with other untrusted software, but we still want the set of enclave traces to be preserved, right? So any, any execution trace of E, those boxes, the concatenation of those boxes on an untrusted platform have to be equivalent to the set of traces that you would get running on a trusted platform where only the enclave was running, right? Um, and no adversary. 
And the second thing is that we provide a certain observation function, the things that the adversary can observe, the part of the state that the adversary can observe, and the knowledge has to be restricted to that. Okay? So that's the definition of secure remote execution. Um, and uh, this definition is uh, a little abstract, right? It's, it's, based, it's basically saying that the semantics of the program has to be preserved uh, as if there was no adversary, and further the adversary knowledge is restricted to this, this observation function. But it's not so easy to verify as is. And so uh, what we have is a so-called decomposition theorem, which says that there are three properties that you can decompose that to, which are called measurement, integrity, and confidentiality. And if you have those three properties, that implies SRE. Okay, so these are the, the, the three properties. Um, so the first one is, is measurement, and informally it means that you're executing the right enclave. Okay. Uh, the second is integrity, which, is, which means that your adversary can only influence the enclave's execution or the enclave state through inputs that it can provide. Okay, so it can't really change what the enclave does uh, any other way. And the third is confidentiality, which says that the adversary knowledge is limited to the observation function. So this is still a little informal. Let me give you a little bit uh, more precise definition of one of them. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to mention is that all three of these properties are uh, what, what are called two safety properties. Okay, so there's in this in the in the set of uh, properties of systems, there are things called trace properties, okay? And trace property is, is one where if you're given a single trace of the system, um, you can tell whether or not it satisfies the property, okay? But in the case of these kinds of properties, it, you can't tell with just a single trace, okay? In general, you need some, some set of traces to tell whether or not the property is satisfied. And uh, a common way to formalize confidentiality is using uh, notions uh, called non-interference uh, based uh, formalizations of confidentiality, and this is one of those. And so the idea here is that, this one is called observational determinism. The idea here is that there, is, there are two things. I, imagine there are two entities executing on the platform. So there's the adversary, which is the red arrows, and the enclave, which is the green arrows. And what we want is that the, the adversary's observations has to be a deterministic function of the adversary's own state and the outputs, the public outputs that the enclave generates and nothing else, okay? So what the adversary can observe and compute can only be a deterministic function of its own state and what the enclave outputs publicly, all right? And so one way to look at that is imagine you have two traces, okay, where the adversary does the same thing so all the actions here are the same, but the enclave does something different. So here you have enclave E, and there let's say we have a different enclave E prime. But they both produce the same public output. So this OBS uh, arrow, this OBS label here, that is indicating that as far as the outputs from E and E prime, they are the same. What it's doing internally, internal computation can be different, okay? Um, and so what we're saying here is that the adversary is identical, but the enclave is possibly different. The adversary will continue to be identical. That is, from the adversary's viewpoint, it cannot tell whether it's running on the platform with E or with E prime. Okay? That's what this uh, property is. It's a very similar formalization for the other two. Yeah. So uh, the question is, can we, do we allow the adversary to use randomization? And uh, in practice, the adversary can use randomization, and we just model it as non-determinism in the adversary. But the point is, the adversary uh, for this will have to make the same non-deterministic choices, right? So you're saying, well, what happens if the adversary does different random things, right? Um, this, in, this, in this particular case, um, what we want to do is make sure that the, advers the adversary's state is controlled for the internal choices that the adversary makes. Right, so the viewpoint from, of this property, right, you're just saying that assume the adversary does, makes all the same choices. But speaking, you can attack if 90% times you are able to attack. So in that case, 90% of the random choices would be fine and 10%. Yeah, so I, what Kuldeep is saying, making is a, is a good point, which is about uh, a lot of the cases, this, something like this is in general too strong a property. Right? Because in the case, you may still have a, a case where 
the secret is, uh, uh, the, the notion of confidentiality is more quantitative, right? You're okay with a, some number of bits being revealed, but, right? And in this case, you would flag an error even if one bit is being revealed. So uh, for, for now, let's ignore that aspect. We're using a non-quantitative version of confidentiality, okay? Um, if you wanted to use a quantitative notion of confidentiality, as you know, right, you'd have to, under the hood, instead of using SAT and SMT as we do, you'd have to use something like model counting. Right? All right, good. So now that's, that's the flavor of property we, have, we are verifying. Okay, so first of all, the, the, the takeaway message I wanted from that particular thing is that the flavor of property is not a, the standard type of safety or liveness property that you're verifying. Um, with something like model checking. It is these two safety properties, okay? So you need verifiers that can support that. The second is that um, you have, uh, you, you want to be able to model the, the platform, right? And so uh, the, the key question is, if you have a secure computing platform uh, like SGX or Sanctum, um, then what are the set of primitives it should support, okay? Um, and so this is what we created. We created a formal specification for platforms like Intel's SGX um, that uh, is independent of the you know, specific instruction set architectures. It also includes multiple adversary models. And so you can kind of compare multiple platform security guarantees using a common formalism. Okay? So this is what the TAP model looks like. First of all, you have to model uh, the abstract state of a CPU and associated memory and um, uh, you know, other data structures used for keeping track of enclave state. And then uh, the idea is that the trusted platform is something that exposes a set of operations that the applications can invoke, okay? And we came up with a set of, uh, you know, about 10 such operations, okay? So the first is you have to model, you have to keep track of what happens when you do memory operations, okay? Because uh, when you do things like a load or store, right, from uh, address in memory, it matters whether the address is in the enclave or not in the enclave, right? So it, it does something to the to underlying uh, uh, enclave metadata and so forth. Okay, so that's, the, you have to model those things. Um, and then you have to model also address translation because that's uh, one of the, the ways in which these platforms uh, track who is trying to uh, 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 you know, access what region of memory and, uh, and then they have appropriate safeguards to make sure that uh, even if the OS is compromised, it can't like, change the, the, the page table and change the mapping, right, so that uh, they can read secret data. Um, then you have all these things that I talked about before, like create an enclave, destroy an enclave, enter, exit, pause an enclave, and then resume it, and so forth. And this is something where you can take a cryptographic hash of uh, the enclave region, okay? So those are the the set of operations that we found was enough to provide this guarantee of secure remote execution, okay? And so um, the TAP model then becomes something like the ISA. It becomes a contract between hardware and software. So for the, the hardware developers, um, if they prove that their hardware implementation refines the TAP, um, then they know that it satisfies secure remote execution. And for the software developers, they can develop their you know, libraries for, to help people program with enclaves uh, as long as you know, they provide the set of operations that uh, spans all the operations in the tap, they know that they can, they're compatible with all the underlying platforms, okay? And so we, we actually have a formal specification, our first formal specification of the tap uh, publicly available. Um, and, um, and this was actually created using the boogie uh, program verifier from Microsoft Research, okay? So Boogie, for those of you who don't know, is uh, uh, a system for sequential program verification, so verifying the kinds of programs that our first speaker talked about um, in uh, a language that they have, uh, the, the, the Boogie folks have, have devised, and they can use back-end SMT-based approaches to solve, uh, uh, to basically um, check if the verification condition is satisfied or not, um, and the default is Z3. Right? And so um, uh, this model is in Boogie, and I'll have more to say about this in a bit. Um, the other crucial aspect of the TAP is the adversary model. Okay? So you, it's very important to uh, model what the adversary can do and cannot do. So we had three kinds of adversaries here. So um, uh, the first adversary we'll call M, and the idea with adversary M is that uh, so M stands for memory. So this adversary can basically 
invoke any operation in the trusted abstract platform specification with arbitrary operands, and uh, they can observe anything in the region of memory that's outside the enclave. So they can see all of the memory except the part that's in the enclave. Okay. Uh, MC is uh, similar in terms of the, the tamper function, in terms of the observation function, uh, they can also observe the state of the cache. So this is getting into side channel attacks where typically there is some mechanism for the attacker to st observe which uh, uh, regions of memory have been loaded into the cache. So you can observe ca certain cache lines. And uh, in this case, we kind of abstract the mechanism away and just say the, the adversary can directly read the cache. Um, and then MC and P is where the adversary can also observe the page table state. Okay? All right. So the first thing is uh, the question, if you have a formal model of the tap, okay, and then you have the secure remote execution properties, which are these three hyper properties, the three two safety properties I talked about. Um, and, uh, and then we were able to prove using Boogie um, that uh, our TAP specification satisfies uh, all these properties for the first adversary and also for the second and third, but with some riders. So for the second one, you need the cache sets to be partitioned, right? So uh, the enclaves, um, cache sets cannot collide with the cache sets of the non-enclave programs. And for the, the most powerful adversary, you also need that the enclave's page tables are private. Some mechanism has to be used so that the, the OS cannot uh, read or write to those page tables. And uh, using those, we were able to show that SGX, Intel's SGX version 1, is secure for the first adversary, but not for the other two. And we were able to replicate uh, attacks that at that time had already been known in the literature, but in a formal way. Uh, and we can show that Sanctum, uh, which is the MIT based uh, MIT Risk V processor, is secure for all these three because it actually does these two things. So, this is what the high level structure of the proof looks like in Boogie. Okay, so, um, so here you have the property of secure remote execution. We have a TAP model. We want to prove that it satisfies this. Uh, for that, we have to be able to prove two safety properties. Um, and the way this is done is using something called self-composition. So it's, there's, it's well known where if you have a, a, a two safety property, you can prove it as a safety property on a system where you make two copies of the, of the program and you run them side by side. Okay, I'm gonna show you a demo of Euclid later where we'll do exactly this and you can see how this is done. Um, and then we have a model of SGX in Boogie and a model of Sanctum in Boogie and we prove refinement. And this refinement is done using a standard simulation-based proof, uh, using induction, right? So we basically are saying, well, if you're in the state of the platform, which corresponds to a state of the tap, and then you make one step here, then the tap can simulate that step, okay? Um, so that's the kind of proof here, yeah. So, adversary, would you do this? I yeah, mean, so adversary is adversarial. Yeah, so these are the three adversaries that we, that, so all these proofs are for these three adversaries. So they were repeated for that first adversary, the second, and the third. Okay, so, um, so this was used, done using Boogie, which is a fairly automated verifier, right? For some, some of you might have used it, um, but it, the effort was significant. Um, the manual effort was significant, okay? Um, and so overall, the, the number of uh, lines of code in the non-white non space, non-blank uh, lines of code was about, non-comment, was about 9,000. Um, and at, if you download this model now and you run it, uh, you will, it, it, it'll complete in a few minutes, right? So it's not that hard to, 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 to complete the proof now, but it took four person months to get the model to that point. And a lot of the hard work was actually what our first speaker talked about, which is coming up with all these auxiliary invariants, right? Um, and so uh, it was really more like a, I wouldn't say automatic verification effort. It was really a, a working with some kind of, a, I mean, a, a very a highly automated proof assistant, but still uh, there was a lot of manual effort there. The other aspect of it that we realized was that it wasn't the right language to, to use to model for this kind of platform, because these uh, platforms involve both hardware and software. Right? There are changes to the, the hardware design 
in uh, the hardware description language, and there are changes in firmware, and then there's changes to the software layers. And in order to do the proof, you need to model all of these, right? And so Boogie is excellent for what it was designed for, which was sequential program verification. But this is not a sequential program. This is a concurrent system, right? But it's a concurrent system which has software components, right? So you would like to be able to have procedures and preconditions and postconditions and all that good stuff, right? So if you look on the other side, if you look at hardware verification tools, right, and tools like new SMV and so on, they are excellent for hardware verification, modeling concurrent transition systems, but they are terrible at modeling and verifying sequential uh, programs, okay? So you need to have something that has both of them. The second is actually the, the, the point that was made very well this morning, which is you need a, a lot more automation in the verification process, right? So generation of inductive invariance is a big one, but that's not the only thing. You also want to be able to do for um, concurrent verification, assume guarantee contracts. Um, and then for verifying hyper properties, which are the types of things that I talked about, you need uh, ways of automating the verification of those things as well, okay? And then finally, uh, we would like to uh, you know, the, the whole verification to be incremental and compositional, because that's the only way it'll scale. Okay, so um, the next part of my talk will focus more on these two aspects, okay? Um, which is really the use of synthesis to try to automate it. Then I'll come back to Euclid 5, and I'll, I'll give you a demo and show you how we can combine both uh, modeling sequential programs as well as concurrent systems in the same uh, uh, formal system. Okay. So um, when we talk about verification, um, even so-called push-button verification like model checking or uh, program verification using you know, uh, whole-style reasoning, there's a lot of things that have to be generated or synthesized, right? So inductive invariance, clearly, right? But also abstractions, right? So it, in practice, you can say, well, I used this abstract domain and I was able to prove it, but how did you come up with that abstract domain, right? That's, that's a challenge. Um, Auxiliary specification, so if you're doing uh, modular verification, you often have to have the pre-post pairs or function summaries. If you're proving refinement, you need to come up with a simulation relation. If you are doing assume guarantee reasoning, you need to come up with the environment assumptions, um, interpolance, ranking functions, um, various kinds of lemmas. In fact, even inside SMT solvers, there is synthesis going on, right, in generating lemmas and patterns for quantifying instantiation and so on. So there's a lot of synthesis happening inside SAT, SMT, and verification tools, right? Um, and so really the effort that uh, we and many others have been trying to do is how do, can you automate that, right? So it's going back to this picture, and um, what, what is, I, I think, uh, maybe I'm underlying the point, but it's really what is crucial to this is coming up with the right model. The right formal model is really crucial to be able to automate all of this. Okay, so now I'll give you an example. So this is actually an example that I think uh, a version of it came up um, in the first talk this morning, right? So um, now, but I'm gonna model things differently. I'm gonna model as transition systems. Okay, so a transition system has state variables. In this case, there are X and Y, which are integer variables. Okay, and an initial state is X is one, Y is one. Uh, the transition relation is that x is updated to x plus y, and y is updated to y plus x, which is the same as x plus y, and that's a simultaneous update. So x and y are, are updated together. Um, the property you want to prove is that always or globally, y is at least one, okay? And uh, the way you do it by induction is you would prove the base case, well, that checks out, but then you'll prove the inductive step, so you'll say if y is greater than or equal to one, and x and y change like this, then then uh, y remains greater than or equal to one, right? And if you do the proof by, try to uh, uh, do this, encode this to your favorite SMT solver, it'll fail uh, because um, you didn't have enough uh, restrictions on what x is, right? Um, and so what you need to do now is find the strengthening. So this is a synthesis problem. Find the phi such that this holds, okay? Um, and so that's one of the phi's that works. Okay, so uh, again, this was made very nicely in the first talk today, that safety verification is, can be reduced to, to inductive synthesis. In fact, the general idea is that a lot of verification tasks can be reduced to synthesis, not just invariance. So the reduction that you see here is you have a transition system with the initial state and, set and transition relation, you have a safety property, 
the verification problem is does the model satisfy the temporal logic property? The synthesis problem that it transforms to is can you synthesize a strengthening of the little phi such that the base case holds and the inductive step holds, right? Okay, but you can also do another synthesis problem, which is um, say, well, I want to do abstraction. So synthesize an, abs an, an abstraction function that maps the set of states to a set of abstract states, okay, such that the abstract model satisfies the property if and only if the, the true model satisfies the property. And in fact, if you look at counterexample guided abstraction refinement, it is basically a way of synthesizing the abstraction uh, or the abstract model in an iterative fashion. Okay. Um, so the point is that big long list that I had in the earlier slide of all the artifacts that are synthesized in verification, you can actually formulate the synthesis of all of those uh, in a similar fashion and, um, and then use some form of synthesis to generate it, right? Um, so the particular flavor that I'll tell you a little bit more about is of synthesis is called syntax-guided synthesis, okay? So um, this is a problem that uh, some of us in the Xscape project created uh, that just tries to capture what people were already doing, right? So the TCS group, we, saw, we heard you have a grammar and then you use the grammar, you search to the grammar of candidate invariants and then you check uh, whether those are, are really true invariants, right? Uh, in program synthesis, what people were doing was searching through uh, a set of, uh, you know, possible template programs and then checking if they satisfy the specification, right? So, um, so syntax-guided synthesis or SIGUS is a problem that is designed to capture this sort of thing, right? So what you do here is you first fix a background theory or combination of theories. You fix the thing you want to synthesize. So we'll think of it as a function here, okay? Uh, and we think we, for this uh, talk, I'll just think of one function, but in general, you can have multiple functions to be synthesized. And then the SIGUS problem is the following. You're given uh, a specification phi, which you think about as an SMT formula, which is in the combination of EUF, uninterpreted functions, and the theory T, okay? And then you're given a grammar, a context-free grammar, uh, which produces expressions that you will use as substitutes for phi. You'll try to synthesize an implementation for phi, okay? So the, the SIGUS problem is the following. You're given phi, you're given T, and phi contains F, and you're given the grammar or the, the language of the grammar, E, and you want to generate a little E in capital E such that if you replace F by E in phi, the resulting formula is valid in the underlying theories. Okay, so the correctness specification phi is your SMT formula and it contains a function f which is treated as uninterpreted. You want to replace that with an implementation where the implementation is drawn from the language of a grammar and you want the resulting formula to, to be valid. So let's look at an example. Okay, so let's say the underlying theory T is uh, linear integer arithmetic, quantify free theory. Um, and f is a function, it's a, it's a binary function, it takes two arguments, x and y, returns an integer. Here's your specification, so in this case you say x is less than f of x, y, and y is less than f of x, y, and then f of x is equal to x or y, right? So what's the function here? x, max, okay, so max of x and y. Um, now let's say this is our grammar. So grammar is the set of all linear expressions. So you can either have x, y, a constant, integer constant, and you can create uh, linear combinations. Um, and if you run, if you try to synthesize something, you will find that there is no solution, right? There is no expression from this grammar, which if, where if you can plug it in, um, it'll make this formula valid, okay? And uh, the key here is that to, to synthesize max, you need to be able to compare, right, x and y. And so a natural way to fix this is you then introduce the if then else, a conditional construct, and then you can get a solution out, right? So this is an example of, of SIGUS. So the Euclid Phi solver that I'm gonna show you now, it uses SIGUS to generate things like invariance. So what it'll do is it'll take a candidate problem, it'll compile that into one or more SIGUS instances, and it will solve them to, uh, to generate invariance or other things. So how it solves SIGUS is a, is a different point, okay? But 
the, the, the idea is it, it reduces problems to a sequence of cycles problems. Okay, so, um, so let me now touch upon very briefly what it takes to solve Saigas problems. Okay, so one thing that uh, you might say is, is sol solving Saigas the same as solving SMT with uh, quantify elimination? Um, and the answer is, well, it depends on your definition of SMT, but certainly uh, if you have uh, quantifiers only over uh, first order variables, then um, you can't really do Saigas using quantified SMT. Sometimes you can reduce it depending on the grammar. So for instance, if your grammar is all linear expressions, then you can do the standard thing where you, you parameter, introduce parameters A, B, and C, um, and then uh, you turn this into a, a quantifier over the, the coefficients, right? But even if it's not quantified SMT, there are ways in which quantified SMT problems are solved that can be reused for Saigas. In fact, the, the CVC for SMT solver um, was turned into a Saigas solver precisely doing this, right? They just reused the techniques, the heuristics they were using uh, for things like quantify instantiation. In general though, and this is an important thing, Saigas problems are undecidable for uh, even very simple uh, theories you know, that are decidable for SMT um, unless the grammar is suitably restricted. So the, the source of undecidability in Saigas often comes from the grammar, right? So if you don't, if you bound the, the length of expressions, then everything becomes decidable. But if you don't, you just specify a grammar, um, then very quickly things become undecidable. We had a paper on this four years ago, if you're interested. Okay, so how is Saigas solved? So this is the connection now to learning, right? So the way Saigas is typically solved is using a, a, a class of learning that I call Oracle Guided Learning. Um, and in particular, what I'll show now is counterexample guided learning. So the idea here is you have really what is a learning algorithm. So this is inductive synthesis. It's learning from, uh, synthesizing from examples. It doesn't know anything about the specification, okay? So it gets a set of examples and it has the grammar and it synthesizes an expression that satisfies all the, uh, the specification on the examples, right? So it's consistent with the examples. It, you pass that candidate to a verification oracle and the oracle, that oracle has access to the specification. So it checks, is the candidate expression, does it satisfy the spec? And if it does, then you're done. That's where you have success. If it doesn't, you produce a counterexample. And this counterexample is added back into the data set, and then you rerun your learning algorithm. So really, this is the common way in which all Saiga solvers work, including the one in CVC, right? The, internally, they have a counterexample guided learning algorithm. Okay, so um, as an example, if you take um, the specification for max that I showed you earlier, and you take your grammar to be uh, things that include the if then else operator, then the way this will work is you start with no examples, um, and then you can come up with any uh, expression from the grammar, say x, um, and then the verification oracle will say, well, this doesn't work because uh, if x is zero and y is one, then uh, the max is gonna be one, this is gonna be zero. So that becomes your first example. Now the learning algorithm has to produce something that will work for zero, one. Um, so let's say it produces y. Now the oracle will say, well, that doesn't work for x equal to one, y equal to zero. You add that back into the set and you'll build up a set of examples and at some point it comes up with the right expression, okay? So all Saiga solvers today use this basic approach. And where they differ is inside this box, okay? For the most part, okay? so. Um, so the, this, this approach, by the way, is, is called counterexample guided inductive synthesis, often goes by the acronym CGIS, uh, something that we came up with uh, in 2006. But the, uh, there are lots of very nice uh, extensions of CGIS for solving SIGUS. Um, one of the first ones was actually using an enumerative approach, um, very simple enumerative approach. Uh, another one was using a SAT-based approach Basically, you take your grammar and you encode your productions uh, using Boolean variables uh, to indicate which productions are being used. And then you solve uh, the SAT problem and you extract the, the, the solution from that. Uh, a third one is using um, uh, stochastic approaches uh, based on work from Alex Aiken's group on uh, super optimization. And that's, this, this is actually the state of the art as of 2013. So we're already six years later, there are lots and lots of alternative approaches. Um, including approaches that actually use machine learning algorithms in the learning box. So people have experimented with neural networks and decision trees and so on. Okay. 
but uh, this is only one way to solve these synthesis problems. Okay, so this is using counterexample guided synthesis. Um, so more broadly, um, this class of synthesis is what we, we characterize as formal inductive synthesis. So a few years ago, we wrote this paper where we said that um, a lot of these uses of synthesis in verification are very different from the kinds of synthesis from examples that people are using elsewhere, right, in uh, programming de by demonstration and so on. And uh, the key point is that you're trying to synthesis from examples while also trying to satisfy a formal specification. Okay, so really the, the paradigm is something like this. You have an oracle that knows the formal specification and you have a learner and there is uh, an interface through which the learner and the oracle communicate, so through queries. And the most common one is what I showed you, which is the query is, uh, is the candidate expression correct, right? Um, that's the counterexample query. Uh, but there are a, a lot more types of queries, and that's what we have in this, talk about in this paper, okay? So generally, the generalized version of this is that you're given a class of artifacts. Think of that as specified by a grammar, if you want. Uh, you're given a formal specification. Then you're given a domain of examples from which you can draw, and you're given this thing called the oracle interface. The oracle interface is all the, the questions that the learner can ask the oracle, okay? And uh, the formal inductive synthesis problem is that the learn, you, have, you want a learning algorithm that has to adhere to that interface, and using that interface, it has to find a candidate specification. But the point here is that you can have queries that are a lot richer and different types of queries than just counterexample queries. So, um, so I'll just make two points here. One is that um, you can, uh, it's been shown that you can use this sort of oracle guided synthesis to generate formal models from implementations. So imagine that you have um, a, a large bod body of code that is um, you know, either in something like C or maybe in the hardware level like Verilog or VHDL, and it's impossible, uh, just won't scale to be able to uh, verify some property directly on that. Okay? However, uh, what I'd like to create is an abstraction of that, a small, more compact model. I'd like to synthesize that abstraction from the implementation. Okay, how do I do that? Right? And it's been shown that you can use not counterexample guided synthesis, but a different oracle guided synthesis to generate this. Um, the second thing is this, those of you who may know the literature on, on query-based learning, so Angloin's algorithm for learning DFAs and things like that, would see a similarity between this picture and what they do there. But the key point of difference between this and that is that in things like Angloin's algorithm, the oracle is fixed and you cannot change it. And here you can actually design both sides of this. All right, so so much for the, the detour over for synthesis. So now what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about Euclid 5 and give you a, a brief demo. Um, so just to recap, um, when we did this verification of trusted platforms, what we realized was two things primarily. One was we needed a better modeling language for both hardware and software, um, and something which includes both of them. And secondly, uh, you want more automation, um, which, is, uh, which we're trying to achieve through synthesis. Okay, and so that's what led to Euclid 5. Um, some background, so Euclid 5 is an evolution of an earlier system that we created uh, called Euclid. So Euclid was actually one of the first uh, SMT solvers and SMT-based verifiers. Um, and it was based on something we call term-level modeling. So the idea here is really, you, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Hardware model checking, for instance, um, that is typically you, your modeling systems using either booleans or bit vectors. Um, and here you're trying to model using a combination of theories that is available with SMT. Um, and you can do things like modern model checking and k-induction and checking simulation and so forth. Okay. Um, and so the Euclid system is something that we uh, used and maintained um, on many projects until 2014, at which point uh, we started working on this new domain and I found that this old system was not really a good match because it was created for modeling hardware-like systems, okay, H hardware model checking, um, and uh, for here you have to have something that models software. So what I'd like to share with you is where the, the, the new Euclid 5 sits in the space, or at least in, uh, aspirationally, um, and I want to make a comparison with different types of tools so I just picked a few examples that you may know. So ABC is a model checker from Berkeley, um, from uh, Bob Brayton's group, 
for hardware model checking, one of the best hardware model checkers uh, from academia today. Um, new XMV is an evolution of the new SMV model checker, uh, which uses SMT. Uh, Boogie is the one that I told you about earlier. Uh, Coq, of course, many of you will know, it's an uh, interactive theorem prover proof assistant. Um, Euclid is the old version of Euclid, and Euclid 5 is the one that we've just created. And what we wanted was really a combination of all of these, which is why the, the last column is green. So green means we want something that can handle all of these things. Uh, so first of all, we want, um, in order to model or do verification of these kinds of trusted platforms, you need something that doesn't just model things at the bit level or bit vector level. Okay, so you want more, ab more abstraction, you want a high degree of automation, uh, you want multiple types of verification. So not just verif you know, doing sequential program verification or uh, model checking linear temporal logic properties. You want really a combination of these. Um, you want modularity. We want, importantly, both the ability to do sequential software updates as well as concurrent updates like you have in hardware. And then you want support for generating counterexamples that is uh, really useful. And this is a, as many industry folks uh, will attest, uh, generating counterexamples is really a really important aspect of a verification tool, right? And so without going into the details, what we found is that there are tools uh, like Boogie, for instance, that is excellent on the things that it was designed for, but really poor on some of the other aspects, right? Um, and so what we found was there was no tool out there that could do all of it. And uh, that's what we're trying to build here. So Euclid 5 is a verifier that is, would be very similar to the kinds of verifiers that you might have used before. So you start with um, a, mo a model, um, and then it goes through a front end phase, um, type checking and instantiation and composition and so forth. It goes through a back end phase, um, and then uh, it invokes a backend uh, SMT solvers as well as Cygus solvers, okay? Um, and then you have all the types that you would have in uh, using SMT. And here's the high-level structure of a Euclid module uh, before I go into the, the demo. So uh, one important aspect of Euclid is that it has both support for modeling concurrent systems as well as sequential software, right? So the concurrent systems, you can think of those as a composition of modules, okay? So the unit uh, it, there is a module, and a module will contain a number of things. So you have, can define your own types, you define state variables, inputs, outputs, um, you can define the initial uh, uh, set of states and the transition relation, you can define a whole bunch of properties, um, but then you can also define procedures. So procedures are the things that, like you would have in Boogie, a language like Boogie, right? You'd have a procedure with precondition, postcondition, assumes, asserts, things like that. And then at the end, we have what is called a control block, which is where you write a little proof script, except that you're not really doing it interactively. This is just giving a set of commands to the, the tool, okay? Um, so what can you do? Um, we can verify everything that Boogie can do, Euclid 5 can do, right? So uh, the, all the standard sequential program verification. Uh, we can also verify uh, invariance and linear temporal logic properties using bounded model checking and k-induction, okay? Uh, we can also verify s a simulation or refinement checking. So you will have one transition system and another one, and you want to check that one simulates the other. Um, and then we can also check two safety hyper properties, like I talked about. Um, we use syntax guided synthesis to automate as much as we can. And what we have realized along the way is that the current Cygus solvers are great, but they really are woefully behind what we need in practice. And then, uh, yeah, this is with respect to the original Euclid, it, it subsumes everything that it could do. Okay, so let me start giving you an actual demo of what it looks like. And then if there is time, I'll tell you a little bit about what we did for verifying absence of spectre meltdown vulnerabilities. Okay, so um, first let me show you some code. Okay, so this is a, uh, an example of a very simple Euclid model. Um, it's actually a, a simplified version, highly simplified version of the kind of problem we have in verifying enclave, whether an enclave platform satisfies uh, the desired properties. Okay, so in this case, uh, what I'm showing you is, um, in, in, in Euclid, of course, you can have like a, a hierarchical structure with files and so on, but here we have everything in one file. Uh, so this, is, this, this first module here is something where we define all the, the types that we're going to use elsewhere. So the point I want to make here is you can define your own types, you can define words, you can define abstract data types like the address that you see up there on line six. Then um, 
you can define memory types. So line 17, uh, you'll see uh, you can define a memory as uh, a, f a function from addresses to data words. You can define you know, axioms. Uh, these are uninterpreted functions. And you can then define an axiom over the uninterpreted function. So those of you who are users of Boogie, all of this stuff will be quite familiar to you, because those are the kinds of things that you can do with, in a verifier like Boogie. Okay. Um, then um, the next thing we have is a, is a model of a very simple CPU. So I'll come back to this at the end. Okay. What I want to show you is the, the top level module. So this is the main module. Okay. And um, so what we are doing here is uh, there's a CPU module that I'll show you later. And what we are doing is we're trying to prove um, two safety property. Okay. And while Euclid has support for uh, proving this directly without me doing an explicit self-composition, I wanted to show you how you do a self-composition. So here I create two instances of the CPU module, but I initialize them with different instruction memories. So the kinds of property that I'm proving is I have a CPU, which is this very simple, simplified trusted platform. And there's going to be a region of memory that is the enclave region. Okay. Um, so let me go to the specification here. So look at this uh, specification the invariant. Okay. So th what this says is uh, the CPU memory in isolated mode, think of that as like enclave mode, has to be identical no matter what the adversary does. Okay. The adversary cannot touch it. So you, now what you have is you have two CPUs where the adversary can do different things because the instruction memory is different. So the adversary you can have can, can do different things. But um, what happens is that as long as your addresses are in the, in the isolated range, which is, this is what this uninterpreted function does. It says that address A, if address A is between the low range and the high range, then the data memory in CPU 1 has to be the same as the data memory in CPU 2. The contents of, at, at that address have to be identical. Okay. So what this, these two properties are saying, they're invariants in the sense of you know, globally being true. Um, it's saying that even if the adversary does different things, the contents of those memories can't change. Okay. And then, um, so what we're really doing here is taking these two copies of the CPU, okay, and they're putting them together, we're composing them synchronously, and then we are checking, does this this model satisfy a property of the form globally P. Okay? So it's, it boils down to a standard safety property check. And now to do this, we're going to do this by induction. Um, so there's nothing new there, but in terms of syntax, you define the initial state. And you'll see here the initial state is defined just as a bunch of assumes. So everything is symbolic using uninterpreted functions and you know, uh, uh, those types of uh, you know, underlying theories, but using symbolic constants. And here, all we are saying is we're going to assume that CPU 1 and CPU 2 have the same sort of protected ranges of, of memory, and the initial, initial state satisfies the invariant that we want to prove. And then down here, look at this. This is the next block. So the next block is, is the transition relation. So we see the next block of the overall system is obtained by stepping both CPU 1 and CPU 2 synchronously. That's what this says. So it's a next of CPU1 says CPU1 makes a step, CPU2 makes a step, and ignore the semicolon. It really means it happens synchronously. And then there's some, uh, this is a, an auxiliary assumption that we, is needed uh, to make the proof go through. Okay. And then um, if I go down to the control block, right, what this says is use induction. In fact, this, by, by default, this is one step induction. If you give it an argument, you can say you can use k as an argument and it'll do k induction. So this says create the verification object v. This one invokes the SMT solver. Uh, this will print the results. And then you can print the counterexample. And you can project the counterexample on a subset of variables. So you can say, I don't want to see the counterexample on everything. Just give it to me on a small subset of the state. And you can make it, you can have expressions there. Okay, and then the other thing that, that you see up here is there's a lot of other invariants, right? So everything up here from 207 down to 1, right? And these are all auxiliary invariants. So we had to come up with these in order to make the proof of those two go through, okay? So this is, these are the things we want to be able to synthesize eventually. Okay, so that's the top level module. And now if I go to the CPU module, okay? 
So the CPU module, um, it's a standard CPU and I won't kind of go through the details of it, but I'll just point out the main things. You define your own types. You, the input to the CPU module is the instruction memory. Um, it has state variables, okay? Um, it has these symbolic constants. So all, everything that's a function is an uninter uninterpreted function, right? So you can do all the kinds of things that you can do in a system like Boogie. And then what it does here is I've defined this procedure which executes an instruction. So it, this takes as input an instruction which is a word. It takes the PC and it returns as a return value the next value of the PC and it modifies all these state variables, right? So this would look to you similar to what we'd see in, in standard program, sequential program verification. And the reason for this is that it's often very convenient to describe properties even of hardware you know, as, a, as a program that does a bunch of updates, right? So, so this just will model what happens in one round of the CPU, one step. And what you'll see is that you can use constructs, you know, uh, so you can have, you know, loops and conditionals and all of that stuff, loop invariants if you need. Uh, asserts, and then you can do havoc in order to um, give a completely arbitrary value to some state variable. But then that procedure is inside the module, and the module has an initial state and the next state, right? And inside the next block here, we are calling the exec instruction function, okay? So you can basically combine these ways of, of modeling transition, concurrent transition systems with initial and next, the transition relation, and also the sequential programs, okay? So the way you'd, you'd run this um, is, uh, that's the file that I just showed you, right? And so this is all implemented in Scala. Um, and so ideally, the way I would run this is I would, you know, initialize uh, the, the JVM and so on first, and then I would run everything. So what I'm not, I'm not really going to do that on this laptop. So each time I run Euclid, it actually does all the initialization first. So this is what you see as the latency. But you know, this will, um, this tries to verify all those invariants and it passes, okay? So not super interesting. If I actually change something, you'll see counterexamples. What I want to show you is synthesis. So I'll, I'll just uh, go quickly to that as we're running short of time, okay? And this, I'll, I've deliberately given you an example that is very simple to the example that the first speaker used, okay, um, and which is on my slide as well, right? So this is the case where you have a transition system with X and Y, and then you update them, um, and the invariant you want to prove is that Y is greater than or equal to zero, right? So if I just use standard induction and run it, Right? So it's just going to try to prove it by induction, um, and um, it'll, it'll come back saying I can't prove it. It, it produces the standard counterexample to induction, right? So it says X can be negative, right? And so um, we know that um, can't happen, and so instead what you can tell Euclid is um, synthesize the invariant for me, and then say, um, and do it using the theory of linear integer arithmetic. Now note, I'm not giving a grammar here. And so what it's going to do is, it's, as the grammar, it's going to use this default grammar for LIA, right? And so then in this case, I also have to um, invoke a certain Saigus solver. So I'm going to use CVC4 because that's the one I have installed on my laptop here. Um, and then I reran that. And now um, what this does is, so just for, to show you, uh, it prints the Saigus problem that it, it generates internally, right? And that's what it looks like, the format. But you can ignore that, just look at this line here. So it's, it says successfully synthesized an invariant, and here's the strengthened invariant, okay? So um, now let me show you another example just to have a little bit of diversity here. So this is an example which is also doing the same thing, but everything is bit vectors. Right? And so all you can do is just say synthesize an invariant using bit vectors, okay? And uh, uh, here's an ex against another very simple example where X and Y start out being zero, and then they're updated to X on each round, okay? And the invariant is that Y is always zero. But to prove that Y is always zero, you need to know that X is also zero, right? Um, and then you can basically invoke it in the same way. Right? 
and it'll come back with the invariant. There's nothing you know, out of the, the way happening here. It's basically invoking a Cygus solver, and it generates that invariant there. Right? We can also do uh, synthesize invariants with arrays and, but, and also do things that are not invariants alone. Um, but I don't have time to show you all that. Okay, so one last thing I'd like to show you is LTL. So this is an, another trivial example um, of a little transition system where um, you have in two input variables to this module A and B, and then uh, this flag initted, and if, you know, it starts out being false, and it's true from the, from the first cycle. Right? And so here, what we can do is we can specify an LTL property. Right? So you have two properties here. This one says it's always true that once you're initted, the sum is A plus B, which is true. And this one leaves out the antecedent. So you know it's not going to be tr satisfied. Right? Um, and then we can run bounded model checking for linear, uh, for LTL. You can also do K induction. Okay? So I won't run, run that, but basically you have the capability of doing all these types of verification. Okay, so one thing I want to mention quickly is that uh, we redid the trusted abstract platform proof in Euclid 5, um, and it's hard to make a comparison because we have the experience of having done the proof in Boogie, right? So it's not a completely fair comparison. However, uh, in terms of the model size, uh, it's uh, less than half the size of the Boogie model. Um, one of the big reasons is that Boogie has no support for hyperproperties. So hyper properties, you have to duplicate everything. And in Euclid, you can just uh, do it automatically. Um, the other thing is uh, that, that we can automate some of the aspects that were manual in Boogie, and it's about a similar amount of time to verify. OK. So one last thing I want to mention is been applying this to other problems in security. The first one is verifying absence of these uh, spectre meltdown style attacks. Um, the second is, is verifying a completely open source alternative to SGX that is being developed at Berkeley called the Keystone platform. And um, so the idea here is that um, there's, there were these attacks that were demonstrated um, that uh, took advantage of these uh, microarchitectural features like speculative execution and branch prediction and so on. And um, people came up with mitigations, both software and hardware level mitigations. And so, um, these mitigations are hard to reason about. It's hard to, for someone to know if it has actually solved the problem. Okay? So for instance, Microsoft came up with a compiler exp extension, um, but they didn't have any formal reasoning for why that compiler ex extension is actually now going to prevent these attacks. And in fact, it, it, it wasn't. You could, uh, you could find attacks against it as well. So what we wanted to do was formulate a very general property that captures this whole class of attacks, not just the specific spectre variants that were demonstrated on the meltdown variants, but the whole category. Um, and then formulate an attacker model and pr produce a way to do automatic verification of these. Okay. So the general problem statement is you're given a model of the platform, which is speculative, uh, a model of what the adversary can do, like observe the cache, and uh, a program, maybe in, in C, you want to determine if the program is vulnerable to a transient execution attack. Okay? So in particular, uh, this is one of the examples that was shown to be vulnerable to Spectre variant 1. And then you can just put in a memory fence here, and then the problem goes away. Okay? Um, so I'll, I'll skip the details of this property we formulated. But the key point I want to make here is it's a, it's a four safety property. So it's a hyper property over you know, four way, uh, four, four different traces. But I'll, I'll skip it because we don't have time. And so now using Euclid 5, what we can do is we can take a program in C. We run it through the um, CMU's binary analysis platform tool. And it generates, uh, so basically we compile that C down to a binary. That, that step is, is not mentioned here. We take the binary and then we decompile it into this intermediate uh, format. Then we pass this to our um, translator that encodes that into a Euclid model. Okay, so it really does verification at the level of the binary. Um, it also takes in formal models of our platform and the attacker also in Euclid 5. Um, and then it, it, it can either check that it, whether it satisfies the secure speculation property, which is a four-way a four safety property, um, or that it's 
it violates it, and then it produces a counterexample. Right? And a counterexample is a sequence of operations that the attacker can do to, to access the secret. Okay. And so, in particular, um, in this work, the, there's uh, this well-known uh, researcher, Paul Kocher, who has done work on, a lot of work on side-channel attacks. And when Spectre and Meltdown came out, he published a list of 15 uh, programs that are vulnerable to these attacks. Okay? So, um, so, he gave all these examples, and then he proposed mitigations. Um, and so, uh, we could use bounded model checking in Euclid 5 to find the vulnerabilities. And then we can use induction to prove that the fixed versions are indeed secure. Okay? And all of this could be done in a few seconds. So, so there's, there's ways already that we have available to go from binaries to, to these programs are very small. So they're, they're basically in this, the C code is of the order of uh, 5, 10 lines of C code. But think of these as the basic tests that they provided to uh, show that if you run this, I mean, you can, uh, this is vulnerable to some variant of Spectre, right? And if you fix it, and then it's no longer vulnerable. So these are actually very, very, very small programs, okay? So, um, which reflects in the runtime numbers. And as we scale things up, it's going to be a lot harder to verify them, okay? So anyway, so we have these paths to go from uh, x86 binaries and also RISC-V binaries to Euclid-5 models. And we also have ways to go from um, hardware description languages into Euclid 5 models. All right, so to conclude, I started out talking about this confluence of trends, right, between verification synthesis um, and learning, and also the fact that um, systems are, uh, there's often, we are seeing this more today, that there's a lot more uh, heterogeneous systems, meaning that nothing is purely software or hardware. Uh, a lot of companies are doing more vertical integration so that they can uh, extract better performance or you have these security guarantees. And so we need formal tools to be able to address um, and leverage these trends. And Euclid 5 is our attempt at trying to do this. Okay? It's, uh, like I mentioned before, it's open source, uh, publicly available, um, and we are uh, very interested in, in growing the community. Right? So if you're interested in using it or even contributing to it and, and developing it, or maybe if you have an idea for synthesis or um, SAT or SMT that would, we would, uh, you think we can benefit from, let us know and we'll integrate that in. Um, so come talk to me if you're interested. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention and here's a few papers in case you want to follow up further. So uh, for when you encode this into Saigas, so is the grammar um, useful for the solver so that it can solve it faster or do you also have constraints that you would really want the functions of the particular form of yeah, the grammar? Good question. So the, uh, I would say both, right? So for a lot of the use cases so far, we have been using the Saigus invariant uh, format, which does not really put any constraints on the grammar except that that they have to um, uh, they allow uh, admit expressions from some underlying theory. So far, the only theories are bit vectors and linear integer arithmetic, which severely restricts the practical application of this. Then we have our the the if you want to verify something like um, like the sanctum, you know these kind of examples that I showed you. What you need is you need bit vectors, arrays, um, that combination of those two, and quantifiers often. And right now, uh, almost no Saigus solvers do a good job of supporting this combination. So for this particular case, what we have to do is um, supply a grammar. Okay. So what we'll have to do is not synthesize full invariance, but we we'll synthesize chunks of invariance that fall uh, in the combinations that uh, solvers can support. Right? Um, and so that's what that's our current approach, right? And then um, uh, then the question becomes, where does how do you come up with a good grammar, right? So there's all the techniques that we heard this morning that one can use. Um, in in our case, uh, there's certain classes of properties we're looking at where the grammar naturally suggests itself, okay, uh, just from the domain. And so um, so basically, we have good heuristics for coming up with the grammar. 
this is a bit tangential but uh, you mentioned that M mc mcp scale of uh, yeah. measuring how much isolation there is uh, that's really interesting because usually when people talk about isolation in a more general sense you know vm containers it's mostly based on intuition like vms are more isolated than containers but we don't really have a scale to like quantify that right. uh, are you work, like do, are, are you familiar with any work that sort of tries to expand that on more general idea like we if we can create a scale which sort of gives a global uh, quantification of that yeah are you any familiar with any work or have you worked on that uh, right okay good question so the the i guess the question is really is there uh, work on a like characterizing or formalizing a range of adversary models mm -hmm. right uh, and then you can compare and contrast uh, or at least given a certain doesn't even have to be a trusted platform right some some uh, program or system that you want to have want to prove secure you can show Try to show what combination of adversary models it is secure against. Yeah, is it like more secure, less secure, exactly. or you could sort of curve it against you know, performance overhead or something. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So um, I would say there's um, there's nothing really out there that is formal, right? Um, especially with with respect to things like um, the hardware level attacks that I talked about, right? You can think about every um, in the microarchitecture, every feature that every resource that is sh shared can become uh, a possible side channel, right? So, for instance, something like the branch target buffer, right? That's that can be one resource that is shared, which is goes outside the MCP, right? So, basically, you can take almost everything that in which multiple programs with different uh, um, which you know, uh, with different uh, levels of privilege or different um, uh, security levels, like you know, enclave versus non-enclave, right? Can all use the same resource, and then you can think of an adversary who can access that resource somehow, right? And that becomes another side channel. And uh, we haven't done it yet, um, so I think it'll be interesting to characterize that and then see, uh, you know, given a solution, which subset of um, at, you know, attacks can uh, is it resilient against? Yeah. Uh, is there a reverse implication of the decomposition theorem as well? I mean, does um, secure remote execution require confidentiality, integrity, and measurement? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so the the short answer there is that uh, there is a reverse implication for for two of them, but. For attestation, um, it's we rely on some of these uh, cryptographic primitives, right? That are be, and so maybe there's alternative ways in order that you can implement it that will also give you attestation without satisfying the measurement property. But you know um, that's something that is sort of outside the scope of what we we make some assumptions about how that is being done. But yes, what do you know that it should go the other way too? Okay, thank you. Just some time. Let's